Viewers, they're back from extinction and ready to howl again after years. We're talking about the dire wolf. A Texas-based biotechnological company has claimed that they have successfully brought back dire wolves from extinction using genetic engineering. According to the company, it has created three genetically engineered wolves that resemble the long extinct species and they are living at an undisclosed secure location in the United States. Our next report gets you more. The last time you saw a dire wolf like this was probably in the popular HBO series Game of Thrones. But this time it's not a TV series. This is reality. For the first time in over 12,500 years, the world is hearing the howls of the dire wolves once again. Declared extinct thousands of years ago, scientists at Colossal Biosciences did the unthinkable. They are calling this the world's first de-extinction. Three dire wolves have been created using ancient DNA recovered from 13,000 year old tooth and a 72,000 year old skull. Using the genome of a grey wolf, scientists actually managed to bring these wolves back to life 12,500 years after they were last spotted on planet Earth. You're watching the News Hour at 10, debate number 3 on Times Now, Super Prime Time. Now joining us for more on this, we have with us Christopher Preston, who's a wildlife expert at the University of Montana. Dr. Ranji Das is a researcher in genetics and evolution, joining us as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Christopher, let me begin by asking you, are we really looking at, uh, you know, uh, the dire wolf uh, being a de uh, extinct version of the dire wolf here? Or are we looking at a version of the grey wolf, as some critics have observed? How do you look at this uh, development of the dire wolf uh, howl once again being heard? In my view, it's more accurate to say we're looking at a gray wolf with some very interesting adaptations. It will certainly look somewhat like a dire wolf, for sure. But in terms of its genetics, it's more gray wolf than dire wolf. Right. Uh, Ranaji Das, what's your opinion on this? And what does it really open up in terms of the possibility of de-extinction of other species? I mean, I think uh, this colossal biosense has a plan to de-extinct many species. That's what I understood from their website. But I don't think we are still there. As uh, uh, he said, it is not exactly the dire wolf as such. It is uh, basically gray wolf and a modified form of gray wolf. And we also have to see how long they survive uh, in the natural environment, uh, because I'm also uh, curious about that. They have done CRISPR gene editing. So after the editing, uh, we don't know how long they will survive and how they actually, if they are sur surviving, whether they're healthy enough and they are adapt properly in the environment, those has to be seen. Then we can think about other species. I mean, I think it's too early to talk about the extinction about other species. Right. According uh, to me. That's you what know, I because there, there are other aspects. You rightly said the genetic editing, uh, gene edits itself, how would that impact on ground is one important thing. But also the yeah. environment itself, Christopher, which would have drastically changed. We're talking about 13,000 years ago to now, 130 centuries later. Obviously, and we've seen quite a bit on global warming and climate change in recent decades. You know, obviously things would have been drastically different when you're talking about such a large amount of time. Yes, there are several things that need to be the same if you are going to get the dire wolf back. I mean, one is the genetics uh, in the nucleus. Another is the genetics outside of the nucleus. Um, another is the environment in which the dire wolf gets gestated. So who is its mother? And finally, uh, the big one is the environment in which the dire wolf gets to live. And as you point out, this is going to be a different environment. And so it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say this is a dire wolf back uh, today, but also it's a it's a large canid, uh, it's a carnivore, and uh, in some cases there are good reasons to talk about reintroducing species that might be missing. Right. No, but, uh, you know, one of the things Dr. Ranji Das is being spoken about, that this process, could it help, for instance, the red wolf and other species that are close to extinction in terms of actually preventing that extinction from taking place on ground? Do you think that this technology perhaps would be helpful, at least in those species? 
I think that's very true. And in, in fact, I think it would be better to present the developments as a development in genetics which helps current conservation concerns. And so the red wolf is in big trouble. The kinds of things they're learning in this process of the dire wolf are very helpful for red wolf conservation. And so in my view, it would be better to uh, lead the story, not with the dramatic headline about a dire wolf, but with perhaps a more practical headline about uh, conservation biotechnologies that can do real good on the ground today. Well, absolutely. That really captures the imaginations, perhaps more sensational, as you rightly put it. But let me take this question across to Dr. Ranaji Das. Dr. Ranaji Das, you know, right from the cloning of Dolly, the sheep, several decades ago, you know, the big question surrounding, you know, all of this uh, uh, quote-unquote man-playing-God debate when it comes to science and genetics is whether there are ethical concerns. In this given case of the dire wolf, do you think there are any ethical concerns in terms of our own biodiversity that perhaps need to be kept in mind? I was actually thinking about Dolly because I knew Dolly will come into the picture because I remember when Dolly was cloned, it was a like, huge hive that it was cloned and on uh, humans playing God and all that. Being an evolutionary biologist, I'm not uh, into God much, I, but so I don't want to go into that God business. But the thing is, there are ethical concerns. I'm a human geneticist mostly, so I work on human populations. When I work on human populations, there are uh, several ethical concerns that we face. So, uh, yeah, uh, when you bring a new species uh, as such to, uh, to a, a different climate, a different environment, different world, there will be concern because it is a kind of a biological pollution that you can think about. For example, when the, uh, suppose uh, the way you transfer one uh, animal or plant from one country to the other, we concern about whether the environment will be changed and all. Here you are bringing a new species which got extinct thousands of years back to a new environment, you do not know what will be the impact. Mm. But yeah, these concerns will be there, but science will progress with this concern. So it, it goes hand in hand. We, we cannot only think about ethics. We cannot only think about science. It has to be a middle ground. That, yeah. uh, but, 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 uh, Dr. Ranajit, let me ask you a question, since you're the expert in genetics here. You know, what is it about gene editing that makes the process very difficult? Is it the fact that one gene has multiple features? Uh, is it the fact yes. that it's very difficult to control the final outcome and it's only through trial yes. and error that this process can be fine-tuned? What is the real challenge here? So the, the, the main issue is genetic pure therapy. So what happens is uh, we are thinking that one gene will do one function. In reality, one gene associated with multiple processes and multiple processes involve multiple genes. It's a mul polygenic multifactorial condition. So that's what I said. Let them grow. Let them uh, adapt to the environment. Uh, what we see in most cases, people may uh, give rise to a new species. New species may come that happen to the doll dolly and all this. Thing. But they properly do not grow properly. Mm. After some time, they die or they are unable to adapt to the environment. Those things happen. Mm. This happens because... There are very, these are mammals, we are mammals. So we are highly complicated group of organisms. It's not a bacteria that we uh, clone or knock in or knock out one gene and all that where we can do speed. It doesn't happen in, in case of complex okay. uh, organisms like mammals. So we have okay. to think about that as well. All right. Gentlemen, almost out of time. One, one question to each of you. Christopher Preston, how close are we to Jurassic Park? I hope we're not very close at all. <laughs> this is the Jurassic Park attracts all of the attention, and this is why a story like this makes the news headlines. Um, but it's not exactly a dire wolf. We're not exactly going to get woolly mammoths back, um, and I think we all need to understand that and, and tone down the excitement. Well, if not Jurassic Park fans, certainly Game of Thrones fans have been very excited with this news. But Dr. Ranaji Das, you know, Elon Musk has, uh, you know, expressed his wish to have a pet woolly mammoth. You know, how realistic are these kind of expectations? Are we going to see experimentations and gene editing on elephants next? Uh, excitements are good, but we should be realistic. We are at least some years away to at least start thinking about the extinction. What is actually happening is some form of hybridization, genetic mm. hybridization. We cannot actually call it the extinction. So yes, there is no Jurassic Park in the near future. Maybe in the future, I don't know. Maybe something will All happen. Right. All right. But All of that now. perhaps is uh, part of uh, science fiction that we've read and seen on the screen so far. Perhaps all of that uh, playing out before us in a different format, as you rightly put it. But Christopher Preston, Dr. Ranjit Das, thank you so much for joining us and explaining this for our viewers.